the book of Amos, chapter 9, verse 9. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. The Bible here is speaking about a great shaking that God promises to do to his people. And I want to emphasize the fact that in verse 10, it says those who are going to be destroyed are all sinners. And also, the Bible says the other group of people that will suffer the judgments of God are those who say, the evil shall not overtake nor prevent us. In other words, the warnings that have been sent don't apply to me. They apply to other people and not to me. I have very shocking, interesting news for you this morning as we are going to look at the shaking and the alpha of apostasy. If you go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, we have seen that with the concept of the shaking, you cannot separate it from the concept of winds uh, that blow away the chaff. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to verse 14. The Bible says that henceforth we be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine. By the slight of man and cunning craftiness, where they lie in wait, to deceive. The Bible here speaks about winds of doctrine that are coming from men. The Bible classifies them as light of men and cunning craftiness. And these men are sitting down prepared to deceive God's people. This is a very interesting uh, description of events. That's what we covered yesterday. I just wanted to do that review. And uh, this morning we want to look at uh, the shaking and the alpha of apostasy. I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Some of these verses, when I started reading them as a new Seventh-day Adventist, I always apply them to Sunday keepers and people that were not Seventh-day Adventist. And I never saw this text applying to myself. But in Matthew chapter 24, who is Jesus talking to? His disciples. Is he talking to non-Christians? Is he talking to Sunday keepers? He's talking to his disciples. And to his disciples who were Christians, who were church leaders in his time, he says in Matthew 24, And Jesus answered and said unto them, the disciples, Take heed that no man deceive you. Have you ever taken this text personally? That as God's people, we are in danger of being deceived. We always use this text to apply it to Sunday keepers who have been deceived about the Sabbath. We always take this text to talk about people that are following Bushiri. We are always taking this text applying to people that are deceived by TB Joshua. But in the context of Matthew 24, the immediate context, the text applies immediately First time, primarily to God's people in the end of time. Take heed that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Verse 24. For they shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. When you read verse 4 and 5, you get this concept of deception is coming. Be careful, God's people. Verse 11, many false prophets will come and many um, false Christ will come and they will deceive many. And many times when we read that word, many, we don't apply it to ourselves. We apply it to someone else. 
We don't think of it applying to ourselves. And in verse 24, we find something supernatural connected with the deception. For these people are going to work signs and wonders. It means that they will be in connection with a supernatural power, not only to perform miracles, but also to deceive. If you go now to the book of First Timothy, chapter 4, the Bible becomes more specific as to where the source of the deception is going to be coming from. First Timothy, chapter 4. Verse 1 and 2. These are verses we started with yesterday. I want to emphasize them, laying a foundation for our study today. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Uh, here it's not Paul speaking, it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is portrayed as speaking very clearly. He wants you to understand what is about to happen. He wants you to get it clearly. So he's speaking in a very clear, audible way. And the Bible says that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. When the verse says, some shall depart from the faith, what is the implication of the text? That they were in the faith or they were never part of the faith? They were in the faith. Do you believe that you are in the faith? Do you believe that when the Bible says some, it may include you? Some, including some of us, shall depart from the faith. What causes them to depart? The Bible says, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Then it says, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Let's start in the last part of verse 2. These people are in the faith. They are hearing convicting messages like the messages we are hearing at this camp on dress reform, on diet reform, on evangelism reform, on movies that we watch, on music that we listen to. And as they listen to these things, they get pricked in their conscience, and then they start silencing the convictions of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. The Bible says they have seared their conscience with a hot iron. They told the Holy Spirit, we don't want you to speak to us. Be silent. I'm going to sin anyhow. Then the Bible says the next step is they start speaking lies in hypocrisy. Because they have seared their conscience with a hot iron, the next thing they do is start living hypocritical lives. Then they are going to yield to seducing spirits and doctrines and devils. And then they will depart from the faith. My friends, I say these things with sadness in my heart. As I look at the history of what happened to God's people in the early 1900s, and these were not simple-minded Seventh-day Adventists I'm going to discuss with you this morning. These were powerful men. Men whom the Lord used. Men whom angels talked to. Men who were used by God to do great things. These were the men that we want to look at together. But before we go to those men, turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Some of us take the devil for granted, but I want to share with you something that is so powerful we find here. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. We know this familiar verse. The Bible says, and the dragon. Who's the dragon? Was wroth with the woman. Who's the woman? What church? Seventh-day Adventist church. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that Satan will be angry in the end of time with the Seventh-day Adventist church and is going to do what? Make war. Contextually, Revelation chapter 12. How does Satan make war? 
Turn with me, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in where? In heaven. And Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. We know that ultimately it ended in a physical war. But how did it start? Revelation chapter 12 tells us that Satan used deception. Do you know that one of the most successful gun, if you will, one of the most successful weapon that Satan has used and he has always succeeded in using it is deception. He used that weapon in heaven to unfallen angels and he succeeded. Ellen White says, originally more than half of the angels were on his side. But ultimately a third were kicked out of heaven. Then, coming with the same weapon that he was learning to perfect, he came to this earth and succeeded in deceiving man in his unfallen nature with a perfect mind whom God talked face to face. We are now standing when Lucifer has gathered 6,000 years experience in perfecting the act of deception. Do you think you can stand against his wiles if you cooperate with him for your own self-destruction by watching movies? You know, when you watch movies, you are asking the devil to come in and knock you off. You are cooperating with the pits of hell for your own spiritual destruction. You are inviting demons to come and possess you. This is what you are toying with. And uh, I'm going to discuss this danger that we are living in as God's people in our time. Deception. Very dangerous deception is about to come upon this earth. I'll talk about the omega of apostasy. Ellen White. In Selected Messages, book one, page 194, she says, The battle is on. Satan and his angels are working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. She then says, They are uniting in their efforts to draw souls away from the truth, away from righteousness, to spread ruin throughout the universe. They work with marvelous industry, to furnish a multitude deceptions to take souls captive. Their efforts are unceasing. The enemy is ever seeking to lead souls into infidelity and skepticism. He would do away with God and with Christ, who was made flesh and dwelt among us, to teach us that in obedience to God, we will we may be victorious over our sins. Key points in this statement. Number one, Satan is busy working without stopping. Doing what? Developing deceptions. And Ellen White says in his industries in hell, he's manufacturing, concocting deceptions for the last generation. And this he penned when the alpha of apostasy began. In the Kellogg crisis in the light, uh, early 1900s. Let me take you through a brief history of this fellow called J.H. Kellogg. John Harvey Kellogg. How many of you don't know anything about him? Very, very illustrious, industrious, powerful man the Seventh-day Adventist Church has ever had. In our time, I look at the most talented Seventh-day Adventists that we now have, and I've been looking at them since the time of Dr. J.H. Kellogg, and I've not found anyone that could parallel him. This man, who began with a passion to be a teacher, he never wanted to be a doctor. He was encouraged by Ellen White and James White to go into medicine. And they encouraged them to go and study medicine, of course, in a secular institution. Dr. J.H. Kellogg became a marvel to men 
and I believe to also angels. He accomplished great things for God. Let me just give you a brief overview of what his accomplishments were. 1876, he takes over Battle Creek Sanitarium. Battle Creek, at that particular time, from about 1866 to about 1876, for about 10 years, the Lord had worked marvelously for that sanitarium. In 10 years, they had 2,000 patients that were coming to the sanitarium. And out of those 2,000 that came, only 10 people died. That made significant historical impact in the ancient world at that time. Why? Because thousands of people perished with medical institutions. Here was an institution that God has just started in 10 years of its operation. It had succeeded at an alarming rate that it got popularity of many people in the United States, in Europe, and in other parts of the world. Many people started flocking to Battle Creek Sanitarium. 1876, J.H. Kellogg takes over leadership. He started introducing new implements in medicine that had never, ever been witnessed before. The Lord gave him genius. Do you know that he was able to invent sitting chairs? He was able to invent operating utensils. He was able to invent things that medical doctors today use. Surgeons use some of the instruments that J.H. Kellogg invented in medicine. He basically, in 1885, if you look at uh, the health magazine, Good Health magazine of January 6, 1885, the Battle Creek Sanitarium, just 10 years after J.H. Kellogg took over, was the largest institution of its kind in the world. It was the largest institution of its kind in the world, 10 years after it took over. When it took over Battle Creek Sanitarium, it was heavy in debt. But within a short time, he had paid it off. J.H. Kellogg was a man of action. Not only was he an inventor, an innovator, not only was he a surgeon in his own right, he was also a nutritionist of profound accomplishment. This man went into the kitchen and invented the famous Kellogg's conflicts. But at that time, he started coming up with a new idea that why should people not be given something that they can eat early in the morning? An inventor, a genius, go to Michigan conference. Go to the state of Michigan and go and watch his inventions and you will be shocked. This man was a genius. Powerful man who highly respected the spirit of prophecy, a leading physician in his time. Other medical doctors went to J.H. Kellogg to learn how to be most effective in his work. And where did he get all this? He got it from the pen of inspiration. At the time when God invented time, energy, and effort to cultivate and perfect this simple man, J.H. Kellogg, and made him a marvel, even to our own generation. God also used Ellen White to prepare a message that would propel J.H. Kellogg forward in his accomplishment. The book, Ministry of Healing, was published. Uh, also, the visions of Ellen White in relation to the councils on diets and food, many of them were also printed. And J.H. Kellogg read the Spirit of Prophecy. He took over these principles of health and he started applying them right away. He told Ellen White, we are using your textbooks, your books as textbooks for our students in our medical institution. I hope that that was the case today at Loma Linda. But I'm sad to say it's not happening. J.H. Kellogg succeeded at an alarming rate. And while all these things were happening, J.H. Kellogg needed a closer walk with God. The Seventh-day Adventists were given a lot of attention because of the Battle Creek Sanitarium, 
We were known all over the world because of that accomplishment. God had a reason for that. Because in 1888, there were movements about 1876, around that same time. Let me give you another side of history so you get the whole picture of what is happening here. I hope I'll have time. There was a Sunday law movement that began in the 1870s where persecution for God's people started in California. W.C. White was persecuted and was, in, uh, was supposed to pay a penalty of $50 for opening the, battle, um, in the publishing press on Sunday and running it. There were other Seventh-day Adventists who were persecuted in the state of Tennessee because Sunday laws were beginning to be agitated in America at that particular time. And we come to the year 1888. Two key events happened that year. There was the famous Righteousness by Faith Conference in Minneapolis, where the message of righteousness by faith was presented by another two men that I'll spend time this morning discussing. First one is A.T. Jones, self-educated man, a genius of another sort, taught by the Holy Spirit. This man had great accomplishments in history. I read our most famous historians of our time, scholars from the BRI Institute in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I can say I've not met a historian that can match A.T. Jones, Alonzo Trevor Jones, a powerful historian who was self-educated. I believe the angels of God guided him to bring about amazing books, thoroughness, and this man's researches were so shocking, if you keep in mind the fact that they did not have any internet, they did not have a collection of libraries that we now have, and they would pour down into history, and I believe God's angels guided them to historical primary sources that they could gather all this information and treasure it, which has not been paralleled even since their time, up to our time. A.T. Jones, whom the Lord used to study the Bible, and he discovered this message of righteousness by faith, and he presented it with such thoroughness, clarity, and eloquence at the 1888 General Conference Session in Minneapolis. A.T. Jones, the Lord used him powerfully. A man whose logic, some historians say, was not easily cracked. So consistent in his logic that the Lord, taking advantage of his cultivation of his mental powers, used him to speak against the bill, the Senate bill. Senator Blair had proposed a bill that the Sunday law was supposed to be enacted in America. It was still under discussion. A.T. Jones stood and defended the position of the Seventh-day Adventist so eloquently that it made a significant impact and such that the bill was not brought to vote. 1888, we have the message of righteousness by faith by A.T. Jones. Another physician, his name is Dr. E. Elliot J. Wagner, a very famous man, who did not have the same fame as J.H. Kellogg. He was not only a physician, but he was also a serious Bible student. These two young men, when J.H. Kellogg took over, Battle Creek Sanitarium, he was in his mid-twenties. When uh, A.T. Jones presented the 1888 message and E.J. Wagner presented the 1888 message, they were just young men in their twenties. The Lord chose simple-minded young men gave them opportunities, knowledge, cultivated talents, invested energies in them because he was preparing his people to wrap it up. Ellen White tells us that the latter rain started falling at that time. God was allowing movements to take over so that this world can be wrapped up. Sunday law was being discussed. Message of righteousness by faith was going around the world. The world was about to be wrapped up. Things were about to go, and Jesus was about to come. But he didn't come. Why? Because of something that happened next. 
because of the great accomplishments of this man, self-centeredness started coming in. They started looking at, I'm going to talk first about Dr. J. H. Kellogg. He started looking at his great accomplishments. He did not wear a black suit. He wore a white suit. He was known wherever he went. People gave him too much attention. Warning to famous people. Until it got to his head. And at that time, when all these things were happening... There were two most powerful people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church around 1881. James White, for obvious reasons, a major pioneer, and a man whom Ellen White describes as the best man that ever trod the shoe leather. Then another powerful man, Dr. J.H. Kellogg. This man were very powerful, the most influential people in the Seventh-day Adventist Church at that time. J.H. Kellogg was not satisfied as being the second most powerful man. He wanted to be the most powerful man in the Seventh-day Adventist church. And Ellen White was shown in vision. J.H. Kellogg, in the corner of his home, he had piled stone after stone. And the angel that comes to Ellen White told him, told her, that all those stones were accumulated, and when J.H. Kellogg was asked what the stones were about, he said this as to stone James White with them. He did not want to be rivaled. He wanted to be the first in everything. At Battle Creek Sanitarium, if he saw a physician rising up to prominence, he would transfer him to another institution. He did not want anyone to outcompete him. J.H. Kellogg wanted control. And through God's providence, of course, James White died and left him alone, J.H. Kellogg. And he thought initially that James White was the one controlling Ellen White's writings. He said, I cannot do what I want because every time I try it, this Ellen White writes something. So it should be coming from James White because James White is fighting for control. So the Lord allowed James White in his providence to rest. And J.H. Kellogg discovered that he could not change Ellen White's mind. So he wanted control. And in 1881, I'm now going to move over quickly to the Kellogg crisis, the pantheism crisis. 1881, J.H. Kellogg met Ellen White and James White and started speaking to them about something that is called pantheism. This is a belief that God is in everything and everything is God. Reading texts such we find in Acts 17, they claim that in him we move and have our being. So we can also be God. And God can be in the trees and God is in the grass and everything is God. So this was the pantheism of uh, first inclining to it that we see in history. But nevertheless, let's move on very quickly because of time. Ellen White was very clear um, to Dr. Kellogg that he should never teach those theories in our institution nor present it to their people. Then in the 1895 conference, J.H. Kellogg started introducing some of these ideologies to other physicians. You have Dr. E.J. Wagner that I spoke about earlier, he started accepting this idea of pantheism. You also have Dr. Paulson, and also you have uh, other medical doctors who started accepting it, uh, this ideology, and it was also publicly introduced in 1899 at the general conference session right there. And uh, what was happening during this time is that because of J.H. Kellogg's influence and towering personality in the church, when he would speak, you know how it sounds like. If you have the most eloquent person speaking, people have a tendency to want to do what? Go with him. Because if you oppose J.H. Kellogg, it appeared like you were not brilliant enough. You were not intelligent enough to understand complex issues. 
So J.S. Kellogg belittled the clergy, the pastors in the church. He said, for starters, they did not go to school. They did not have the same level of academic excellence that he had. So they don't have any right to try and control him. They, he wanted to separate the medical work from the evangelism work. I don't have time to go through all that history, but the sad part of this history is that he wanted control, and control he got. And Satan had a plan. This was a reaction. I shared with you this part of history of great preparation to close up this S history. Now Satan comes back with a counterfeit. He takes the same man that God decided to use to bring this wicked world to an end, and he starts leading them to self-centeredness. He started with J.S. Kellogg turning him around. And Ellen White actually says um, in Letter 51, 1904, during that meeting, a scene was presented to me, representing evil angels conversing with the doctor. He's talking about Dr. Kellogg. And imbuing him with their spirit so that at times he would say and do things the nature of which he could not understand. He seemed powerless to escape this snare. At other times, he would appear rational. So J.H. Kellogg communicated with evil angels. He had power to hypnotize people. So God, I mean, evil angels, Satan took him, and through his influence and his eloquence, he used it for his own powers. In J.H. Kellogg, evil had found a willing servant. It's very sad. And before that, Ellen White wrote warning after warning after warning. J.H. Kellogg, Satan has a plan to ensnare you. Be careful. And he took those warnings lightly, like most of us do. When the Bible says many will be deceived, some shall depart from the faith, of course it's not talking about me. This is just an idea that you don't understand, Ellen White, because you are an old woman. I am a medical doctor of great academic achievements. The pantheism thing is actually found in your writings. You don't just understand that what I'm teaching is the same thing that you are teaching. J.H. Kellogg was an instrument now in the hands of Satan. In the hands of Satan, he presented in the 1899 general conference session. And at the general conference session, not only A.T. Jones, but Dr. E.J. Wagner also presented the same pantheism things. So, and then other doctors, Dr. Paulson, physicians started speaking about pantheism at the 1899 general conference session. Then Ellen White wrote a letter to them. It's found in the general conference daily bulletin of March 6, 1899, very, very clearly telling them that nature is not God and never was God. The voice of nature testifies of God, declaring his glory, but nature itself is not God, as God's created work, but it bears a testimony of the power of God. So she basically told them, what you are teaching is wrong, but they didn't take this message seriously. 1902, pantheism becomes much more popular. And coupled with other things, I don't have time to share it with you, 1902, something major happens. 1902, the Battle Creek Sanitarium burns to the ground as a result of rejecting the testimony that Ellen White had given that we should not build large institutions. So the Battle Creek, this big lifestyle center that was a marvel to the world, bent to the ground. J.H. Kellogg was on a train at that time when he received the news. Immediately received the news, he took out a large piece of paper and started drafting plans for a bigger, larger institution that would excel the one that burned to the ground. And then in the 1902 General Conference, A.G. Daniels, who was the president of the General Conference at that time, met with Dr. Kellogg, and uh, they both said, you know what, we need to do something about the sanitarium. Ellen White's writings were very clear that you should not build a large sanitarium. 
make it small, and let it be spread all over the United States. But that would not feed J.H. Kellogg's ego. He wanted something bigger so that he gets the glory. And so the church agreed to some of the plans that, the, the plans that he had making because he was proposing that, um, I mean, A.G. Daniels was the one that went to him and he said, you know what? Ellen White wrote the book Christ Object Lessons to help sponsor and support the building of this institution. Why don't you write a book? And that book was written uh, by Dr. Kellogg. But when A.G. Daniels told him this, he said, you know what? Make sure that you don't include any of those pantheistic theories in your book. Dr. Kellogg said yes, but that would also take glory from him, right? So he put everything, and the book that he published was The Living Temple. Talked about the human body, powerful concepts that he shared in that book. But coupled with that, he had this pantheistic belief system that he was teaching. That God is in us, and God is living in us, and every time we breathe in and out, we are breathing the Holy Spirit. Very dangerous theories that when they first started in a church, when he started presenting them, A.T. Jones was taken, E.J. Wagner was taken, almost all the ministers in our church were taken. There was so much confusion in 1905 that nobody knew what was truth. They were just saying, this is new light, and we don't understand it fully, but maybe it's truth. It only took God, through the pen of inspiration, Ellen White, to reveal to them that the teachings in the book, Living Temple, were from the pits of hell. And that if accepted, they were going to lead to some of these things that I'm going to mention here. She said, the results of this book, Living Temple, in letter 271, 1903, would be that it's going to lead people into spiritualism. That's why I love last night's presentation. Satan's plan was, I'm going to get these people to shake hands with spiritualism. And I'm going to use a book, The Living Temple, to get that done. And he succeeded to a certain extent with most of our leaders. Then she says the living temple was going to lead people into free loveism. In other words, to freely love one another. Not in a Christian sense, but in a satanic sense. As it happened with Dr. E.J. Wagner. I'll share with, that, with you that later on. So it led to spiritualism. It leads to this free love concept. It also leads to another thing that is very, very important, which is if God is in everything, like J.H. Kellogg said, if the cleansing of the temple is the forgiveness of sin, because you'd ask you a question, where is God? And then you say, God is in heaven. Then he's asking you, isn't God everywhere? Then what would you say? Yes, he's everywhere. Then the next question is, isn't heaven everywhere? If he's in heaven, yes. So what is the cleansing of the temple? Then he would point to his heart and say, this is where sin is. This is where God is. This is the temple that has been cleansed. Dangerous deception that his main target, which is the main point of sharing all these things to you, was to uproot our sanctuary doctrine. To destroy the concept of God in the minds of people. To destroy the concept of the atonement. Number four, to destroy the authority of the spirit of prophecy. Time is my enemy. With J.A.'s color crisis, you'll find those four key things, which are the main things why I shared all this history for you. The reaction of Lucifer. Number one, to attack the sanctuary doctrine. Number two, Two, lead people into what? Spiritualism. Number three, to do away with the atonement, the concept of the atonement. Number four, to lead to the rejection of the spirit of prophecy. Then, to also capture 
the most brilliant, talented, eloquent speakers of the church at that time. A.F. Ballinger was another name that you need to read about in the Adventist history. This man started also teaching false theories about the sanctuary doctrine. So Satan was attacking the sanctuary doctrine through J.H. Kellogg's theory, through A.F. Ballinger's theory, and also through Dr. E.J. Wagner's later theories that were against the sanctuary doctrine. So his main target in the Alpha of Apostasy was the sanctuary. Number two target was the doctrine of God. Who is God? What is the nature of God? The personality of God was under challenge in the pantheism crisis. It's under challenge today, and that's why tomorrow I'm going to discuss the Godhead. It's something that Satan started with in heaven, and to, in the final crisis, it will be one of the things that he will also target. The third thing that happened that I want to finish up this presentation this morning with is the sad story of A.T. Jones. About 1905, A.T. Jones went to Ellen White's home in St. Helena in California, uh, Elm's Haven. And she said, Mother White, Dr. Kellogg has invited me to come over to Michigan so that I could do, teach Bible classes there. And Ellen White told A.T. Jones, the Lord has shown me in vision that you should not go there. If you go there, you will be deceived. A.T. Jones, being self-confident as he was, he said, no, I will not be. I'm just going to understand what, AT, uh, what Dr. Kellogg is talking about. I just want to understand this pantheism thing so that I could correct him. Ellen White tried everything he could. A.T. Jones went. Within two weeks, he was captured. Because he wasn't dealing with just Dr. Kellogg. He was dealing with evil angels that were influencing Dr. Kellogg. And uh, historically, in 1906, the Bible, I mean, Ellen White tells us that A.T. Jones, he has chosen darkness rather than light. June 15, this was in March, May 1, just June 15, two weeks later, 1906, the voice of A.T. Jones was controlled by Dr. Kellogg. November 11, 1908, two years later, A.T. Jones has departed from the faith. What is very interesting is that in 1909, A.T. Jones wrote a letter and appeal to speak to the leadership of the church, and they agreed to meet him. A.G. Daniels was there in the meeting, plus several other men, the general conference president at that time. So A.T. Jones came. There were a lot of discussions that took place. And then what was said is that A.G. Daniels stood up. A.T. Jones was sitting on the other side of the table. And he started narrating the history of A.T. Jones before him, the great accomplishments that he made. And what a privilege and an honor it was for the church to work with him. Then, turning to Brother Jones, he made a very tender and very strong appeal to him. He stood up and looked at him, and with tears in his voice, he extended his hand across the table and said, A.T. Jones, come back. We want to work with you. Come back, brother. It's still early enough. You don't need to go now. Come. A.T. Jones stood up, took his hand, and he stretched it towards A.G. Daniels. And as A.G. Daniels continued appealing, he would withdraw his hand. Then the appeal would come again. And he would stretch his hand. Then withdraw it. Then an appeal would come again. He would stretch his hand and withdraw it. At that time, A.G. Daniels was crying, weeping. And many people, leaders and pastors in the church, were weeping. A.T. Jones stretched out his hand for the very last time. 
And he pulled it back and he said, never. And he sat down and walked out of that meeting. And that was the last of A.T. Jones. E.J. Wagner fell because of women. This is the sad ending of men whom the Lord used. Same time, when this was happening, you have the Holy Flesh movement. It was a movement that was in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that started introducing a new form of worship where people were dancing and there was drums and music and all these kinds of things that were happening. And it started at the camp meeting in Indiana. And Ellen White tells us that men and women, supposed to be guided by the Holy Spirit, held meeting in a state of nudity. This was what was happening in the Alpha of Apostasy. Then, of course, we have the A.F. Ballinger's teachings. In a nutshell, this is what I'm saying. I covered a lot of history for you. Let me summarize it so that you can follow very clearly what I wanted to share with you. And uh, just before I forget, we have a lot of literature available that will cover a lot of this thing in more detail than I've had time here. You can read this history for yourself. We have it in the books. They are going to be shown right here. But that was just a side note. Anyway... God used his man to prepare the world for his second coming. And because they were not guarded enough, Satan led them into self-centeredness. And through self-centeredness, he was able to react, or to cause a reaction and to counterfeit the work of God. And the same man with the same talents and skills that God used, now Satan employed in his kingdom to work his own accomplishment. This was the Alpha of Apostasy. And how did he do that? He used the Pantheism crisis, the Keller crisis. And what were the accomplishments of the Keller crisis? It led people to doubt uh, the nature of God, the personality of God, the relationship of the members of the Godhead. I don't have time to show you that here. It led people to doubt the existence of the sanctuary in heaven. It led people to doubt the atonement. It led people to doubt the spirit of prophecy. Then A.T. Jones, theories started leading people to doubt church organization. And you also have the um, Holy Flesh movement that started introducing a new form of worship with drums and music that Ellen White said will be repeated later on in the Omega of Apostasy. We'll talk about that a little bit later in our meetings this week. So this is, in a nutshell, the Alpha of Apostasy. The Alpha of Apostasy was basically this. It was to undermine the pillars of our faith so that when people's understanding of our pillars of our faith are shaken, then there's nothing concrete that God's people can base their decisions on. Do you know that the Alpha was just the seeds 1919 Bible Conference started watering those seeds of skepticism against the writings of Ellen White. And then 1957, Questions on Doctrine, started strengthening. We are now seeing the fruits of it. What we are looking at now in the Seventh-day Adventist Church is fruits of the Alpha of Apostasy. This is where we are. What we are going to be discussing this week is just we are addressing the tree that was planted by the Alpha of Apostasy. The remaining few minutes, I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10. We know the verse very well. And I fell at his feet to worship him. Stop there. Who he is speaking? John, the Apostle John, who was the one that resembled Christ more than any of the apostles. Gabriel, who is the angel showing him the book of Revelation, comes to him, he reveals to him all these things from chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to chapter 19. And he is overwhelmed by these revelations 
that he was told is coming from God the Father, and the angel is just a messenger. And this John bows down, kneels, and he wants to worship an angel. Do you understand what I'm saying? And he doesn't do it once. Go to chapter 22, verse 8. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them and seen, I fell down. He doesn't say I was trying to. He said I fell down on my knees to worship before the feet of the angel that showed me these things. This is the same angel that occupied the same position of Lucifer. This is voluntary. John is just perplexed. He is just taken. And he's just overwhelmed by the majesty of the angel that he just falls down and he wants to worship him. And this is so amazing to me. Now, what is even so amazing, pointed out by one preacher, in Revelation chapter 17, go there, verse 6, a text that puzzled me for some time. It says, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. This is John in vision seeing the papacy and the great accomplishments of the papacy. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I did what? I wondered with what? With great admiration. This is a prophet of God in vision. The, the Holy Spirit is just causing the papacy and all its accomplishment to come before a prophet of God. And he's just, oh, he wonders with great admiration at the men of Syrian. Do you understand my point? We take Satan for granted. This is a master deceiver. His majesty, his ability to deceive is so powerful that without the Holy Spirit, you will be deceived. That's why it's important to make sure that we are one with Jesus. I speak with sadness in my heart as I look at man in our generation that God used powerfully some of the mighty preachers at GYC that have stopped preaching now. Mighty man that God used to speak and teach us great truths. Many men that we have admired for their brilliance have gone down. This has started. We are now not in the Alpha, but in the Omega of apostasy. Satan has unleashed all his weapons of warfare. The main purpose of this presentation this morning was... Let us be careful. Take heed that no man deceive you. If Dr. Kellogg could be deceived, if A.T. Jones could be deceived, you will be deceived if you are not connected with Christ. If you are not studying the Bible, if you are not living according to all the light that God has given you, the Bible says those who do not love the truth will be deceived. How many of you want to say, Lord, keep me from falling? I don't want to repeat the life of this mighty man. Let us kneel down for prayer. Father in heaven, we want to be there in the gates fair and wide. Dr. Kellogg never watched any movies. There were no televisions in his time. There was no music that we have now. There was no Facebook to steal away his time. But Satan was persevering and diligent enough to overthrow him from the faith. Same with A.T. Jones. Lord, we are not studying half the way that men study the Bible. We are not researching half 
what they did. Instead, we are playing with Satan and allowing him to overthrow us by not having family devotions, by not studying the spiritual prophecy as if our own salvation depended on it, by not reading the Bible. We are not consecrating our lives to you every day. Instead, we are spending hours and hours on Facebook, on WhatsApp, wasting time and whiling our time with speaking nonsense and not searching the scriptures and making sure that we are in harmony with you. And we excuse our weaknesses saying, we are just fallen. It's a struggle. I'm just struggling with it. We are not making any efforts to overcome. Forgive us, Lord, for we are in a danger that we are not even aware of. When your prophet looked at us, he said, I tremble for our people. That's why. Because we don't even see our danger. We are walking right into the enemy's territory, smiling and expecting peace. Help us to be ready. Wake us up from our spiritual slumber. And help us to study our Bibles that we have never done before. Bless us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.